Hi, everyone. Welcome to Dean's Chat, where we discuss all things podiatric medicine. My name is Dr. Jeffrey Jensen. I'm the Dean at the Arizona College of Podiatric Medicine and the host for the Dean's Chat podcast. As always, we're bringing you leaders and voices in the podiatric medicine. And this week, we are joined by Dr. Barry Rosenblum from Boston. He's an attendant attending with the famous New England Deaconess Medical Center, which is now the Beth Israel Deaconess Medical Center. Welcome to Dean's Chat, Barry. Hey, thank you for the invitation, Jeff. It's a pleasure. And we're, we're already on first name basis because that's usually what we do at the Dean's Chat. So let's continue with that. How's that sound? Absolutely great. Well, a lot of times, uh, Barry, we, we I do a really long introduction and, and I was looking at your CV and you're certainly worthy of that. But as we discussed yesterday, uh, maybe we'll touch on your history as we go through and maybe to start off, if you wouldn't mind sharing with us how you found out about podiatric medicine and perhaps your educational journey, the floor is yours. Absolutely. I went to undergrad at the University of Rochester in upstate New York, and at the end of my junior, maybe early senior year, I was working in a research lab, and my goal at that time was to go on the education track. I was going to you know, get my master's, get my PhD in radiation biology and biophysics, and um, my best friend at the time, and also um, my girlfriend at the time, who then became my wife, uh, said, do you really want to be working in a lab for the rest of your life? And I kind of asked myself the question, does that really sound like what I want to do? And uh, at the same time, I realized that one of my fraternity brothers, who was two years ahead of me, uh, was a second year student at the Scholl College of Podiatric Medicine in Chicago. And he said, you know, podiatry seems like a really good career. Why don't you think about it? So I made arrangements to fly out to Chicago. I interviewed at one podiatry school. I got accepted. Um, went to podiatry school at, at Scholl. Got graduated in 1987. Uh, did my residency at the New England Deaconess Hospital for two years, then did a fellowship there. And then I looked around for jobs, but the group there asked me to stay on. And uh, I was really excited about staying in a teaching hospital, um, had a combination of a private practice and a multidisciplinary group, as well as residents and trainees. So I stayed and uh, that's where I established my roots. And that's where I've been ever since. That's amazing because not a lot of people get into a work situation where they they stay there for for their whole career. So congratulations on that. Well, I don't know if congratulations is in order. My wife thinks I'm crazy, but I love it. So you you were with your wife uh, back in college. So was I. How long have you been married now? Uh, my wife and I actually we were the uh, she was the first person I met in co in college at orientation. Oh my god! So we met uh, in 1979 when we were literally high school seniors. And we have been married almost 39 years. Wow, congratulations. That's great. Thank you. So, Barry, you know, when I think back uh, about my educational experience, I was always in awe of the, of the New England Deaconess experience. I used to carry around Dr. Freiberg's book, and, you know, I would read the names of Dr. Habershaw or Dr. Giarini or, or Gary Gibbons. What was it like being in that environment as a young resident, then all of a sudden you're peers with them? How, how did that play out? Well, you know, it, it, that's a great question. I mean, there used to be such a great team approach to the management of the diabetic foot. We had, you know, legendary vascular surgeons, such as you mentioned, Gary Gibbons, David Campbell. Um, before that, there had been uh, Frank Wheelock and John Robotham and Carl Hoare, um, Frank Pompicelli, who, who was there for many years, Frank Legerfo, who's done all sorts of seminal work on, on microvascular disease in the diabetic foot. And combine that with the group that we had on the podiatry side. My mentor, uh, Jeff Habershaw, who we had discussed previously, um, met his untimely death. It was shocking. He retired, moved to Hawaii, uh, and then suddenly died, um, which just tells you that life is too short. Um, he, he was incredible. I mean, Bob Freiberg was there. Yes, John Gerini's still there. And he and I have worked together for many years. But, but Jeff, and if you don't mind me talking a little bit about mentorship for a oh, little bit. Please do. Jeff Habershaw was the kind of guy that would just do it, but not look for the limelight. And, and he was doing things at the time that were so far ahead of the curve. Um, simple things that we look at now, like metatarsal osteotomies, um, uh, Charcot reconstructions, uh, you know, anything to avoid an amputation, pan metatarsal head resections back in the day before we were allowed to do TMAs in Massachusetts. He was doing things to salvage even toes. And you know, it, it was just an incredible experience. And I still get this, these moments where I have this little Jeff Habershaw on my shoulder. And if I'm in the operating room and I'm kind of puzzled, I'll say, what would, what would Jeff do? Wow. And, and he had so many little things and maybe they'll come out during the course of this conversation. 
so many little sayings that that I just reverberate in my head over and over and over again when I'm faced with a difficult decision intraoperatively. You know, isn't that interesting? Because I've been doing this Dean's chat, maybe this is the 20th episode or so. And I try to bring in leaders in the profession, people that have been around the block and um, people that are training other doctors to be great surgeons. Uh, but one of the common themes, Barry, is that all of us have had tremendous mentorship. And when you bring up Dr. Habershaw, um, it just validates everything that that I've been thinking, that we all need people to show us how to how to be successful and how to present ourselves appropriately. Um, I'm glad you mentioned that. Yeah, no, thanks. Thanks for bringing up mentorship. I think it's so important because, you know, I, I, I give this lecture, um, it, it's, a, it's a malpractice lecture because, um, you know, I, as most of us or many of us have, I've I've been sued, and and so when faced with a malpractice case, fortunately, um, you know we won jury defense verdict, so it was great, a great outcome for me. Um, but I give this lecture that call, that's called "I Thought I Was Invincible and Then I Got Sued," mm. and the same thing could be said for thinking when you get done with residency that you know everything, and you really don't, and and so it's always good to be able to fall back on somebody that has that experience to ask a question, to run something by them, even after you're done with your training. So I agree with you. That's interesting. I've got the same thing. I've never thought about it as having your mentor on your shoulder, you know, way, oh, helping you and, and guiding you along. Mm -hmm. I think that's that's just such a great uh, metaphor for the impact that people have on our careers. I just think that's Absolutely. Great. So let me, let's let's shift the gears just a little bit. Uh, you obviously have education in your blood. You've been training students and residents for decades. Uh, what what do you see? I mean, what 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 is the motivation to continue to do that year after year? And how have you seen uh, the education evolved over time? Well, you know, it, it's ironic that you ask that. Um, this morning, I, um, I I covered one of my associates' clinic, um, and and so I saw. A lot of their patients, and and then we also have sort of an urgent care clinic setting where the residents see things and triage them. And and I had a clinic full of residents, students. We actually have a vascular fellow rotating with us. Okay. And, and so I had all of these people, and it just energizes me to be in the same clinic as them and to and to see patients, show them an examination, show them how to make a diagnosis. Um, confirm when they're right, but also steer them in the right direction when they're when they're not so right. And and I have other clinics that I go to where I don't have residents, I don't have students, I just have nurses and medical assistants. And and people ask, well, why do you keep going back to the mothership? And this is the kind of day that does it. I mean, I get I get home and I'm excited, and I'm excited to go back tomorrow when I'm in clinic again with the same team. And and so that's why I keep going back to it. Um, if it was boring, if it wasn't exciting and wasn't, you know, making my juices flow, then I, I would give it up because there's other things that I could do where I don't need that. Sure. Now you asked, what have I seen change over time? Um, I think one of the things that I've seen change is technology, um, the ability to answer a question. If you don't know the answer right away, just look it up in the palm of your hand. I mean, you and I used to have to go to the PDR or, or Indexus Medicus. Right. to look up an answer. And and I tell students when we have interviews or we have mock interviews that, you know, knowing the dose of a medication, if you don't know it right off the bat, you need to know the medication, but you can look the dose up on your phone. Don't stress over things like that. But I think technology has been a big change in, in, in the learning paradigm. I agree with you. In fact, knowledge seems like a commodity if you look at it that way. And I've told my students, a lot of times it's those soft skills that are going to make a difference in your career because you're going to get the training. You're going to take the exams and know the material. It's how you interface with your co-residents, your attendings, the nursing staff, uh, referring doctors. Um, it's it, Those soft skills are really moving up the ladder of hierarchy, aren't they? Well, you know, it's interesting, um, especially in a morning like, like this morning where I had residents and students in every room, uh, one of the adages, and maybe we'll go through a couple of these during the course of this uh, this session, but one of the things I tell the students and the residents is you can rush into a room, but don't rush out of it. And yeah. so a patient might see that you're in a hurry, but if they feel like you're in a hurry with them, that's gonna that's a turnoff. You could make the right diagnosis, you could treat them well, you could do everything right. But if that connection isn't there, 
that's those are the bad habits. If you rush out of a room, that that a resident starts to get, and a student starts to get, and you lose the patient. So I, I think it's I think that's all it, the people skills that that you can't teach, and you only end up seeing leading by example. Well, that's a really really good point. You know, every year when our students are looking to sign up for clerkships, I'm always recommending they go out to your program, and I tell them they'll get a great experience and they're going to advance their knowledge. And it'll give them not only a educational opportunity, but really a professional opportunity uh, to to show them what it's like to be a doctor in a, in a in an academic health setting. And nothing is more fun for me, Barry, than when you send me those texts of pictures of the students, and <laughs> comments on them, and and so I I just uh, I just it just warms my heart when I get those, and I appreciate your all your guidance of our students because they come home back to Colorado or. Arizona, and they just they they just are raving about your program. Well, I think one of the things that I've shared with you is that if this is truly, and I share this with Rob Snyder as well for some of his students, if this is the future of podiatry, the profession is in good hands. I agree with you. No, there's no doubt about that. Uh, interesting that we comment on on that. Let's come right back around to that because uh, I wanted to ask you a little bit more about uh, the diabetic foot before we get into more social things. So you've been a, a prolific researcher and, and a writer, and you've been an environment to do that. Um, how do you maintain, uh, you know, all of the the research and the clinic and the family life? I, there's a lot going on, right? I mean, if we let our, you know, clinics and our research uh, take over, they certainly will. H- how do you balance all that? And uh, what do you think of the future of secondary question? Future of clinical trials, especially in the diabetic foot. Well, you know, I think one of the things I learned early on, and and if you'd ask my wife, she'd say, I still haven't learned it. Um, but you need to be able to say no. If you get invited to a number of lectures to give or a number of meetings to attend or, uh, you know, a number of, of trials to be involved with, you, you, you get to a point where you've got to be able to say no, or you just won't have any time anymore. And And then the things that are important to you, as you well know, um, your, your family life starts to suffer, the time that you're home, and you don't get that back. Right. You can get back the next book chapter that you're writing or the next paper that you're involved with or the next research project, but you can't get the time with your family back. Mm-hmm. And and we're empty nesters now, and we can certainly talk about that a little bit later. But um, it what is it? The the days are long, but the years are short. And Boy. and I think I think that is is very true. So it's a it's a fine balance. And ironically, when my wife feels like I'm getting stretched a little too thin, she doesn't even realize the things that I've turned down. And and so I think it's a huge balance and some people balance it a little bit differently. Um, I think over the past 30 some odd years that I've been working, um, I've done it as best as I could. I've given back to the profession that's been so good to me, but I've also been able to be there for my family when, uh, when they need me as well. Um, you asked about clinical trials. Um, you know, I think one of the things, and I, and I heard a great podcast that you did with Jason Hanft. Um, that was terrific. I mean, Jason was a year behind me and he was, uh, it, it was great. I mean, I could listen to that one over and over and over again. Um, I think when it comes to clinical trials regarding the diabetic foot, I think what we're seeing, um, is we're, is we're seeing, uh, podiatry, podiatrists, foot and ankle surgeons put out really good work. Um, and I think schools of thought. I think uh, companies are seeing that, whether it's offloading companies, as you're you know, well aware of, and offloading products, as Jason is aware of. I think we're starting to see them with wound products. If you go to SAWC, there's plenty of podiatrists that are presenting uh, at major medical meetings. And, and so I think the future is bright when it comes to clinical trials, specifically related to the diabetic foot. Yep. But I, there's more to do. Uh, there's a lot more to do. So, so first off, I, I think you're absolutely right. I think giving ourselves permission to say no when we're young in our career and we're getting established, I think is very hard. I had the same issues, but I'll never forget, Barry, one time I went to Vegas in front of living in Denver. I went to Vegas, gave a lecture, missed my one of my, my son. My oldest son was like five years old. I missed his little soccer game. And I remember coming home thinking to myself, yeah, I'm going to start saying no because I didn't want to miss all their games and things. So, Well, it reminds me of that Harry Chapin song, Cats in the Cradle. 100%. Absolutely. And 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 what I ended up doing, and this sort of jumps ahead a little bit as far as you know, time being home, is um, whenever I would have, my son went to college in Oregon. And so whenever he would, whenever I would have a meeting west of the Mississippi, I would always tag along a trip to the West Coast to see him. And, and I combined, you know, business with pleasure. 
Uh, because otherwise he's out there on the West coast. You know, we can't get out there as frequently as you could, if you're only a couple hours away by a car ride. And, and so that I kind of made the best of, of that situation and it, and it worked for me. No, that's, that's great. And you know what, it's always good to be able to mix business with pleasure because time is, time's the only uh, entity that we really have can't change. Right. It just goes. Absolutely. Absolutely. So talking about some of those diabetic foot trials, and I did a lot of them over the years too. Um, you know, one of the challenges I was, I was talking with one of our docs at the university. Do you remember when the Genentech came out with a uh, vascular endothelial growth factor, VEGF, it was going to be this great yeah, trial yeah. and it was going to be, it was going to be absolutely, you know, game changing for all of us. Sure. Sure. And I remember, um, during the trial, they were they weren't really offloading because we could talk about offloading. And remember, they did an interim analysis and they came back and said we're going to stop the trial. Um, I can't help but think of how many great products have come down through the pike that we've been researching. And because there's so many variables we need to control with the diabetic foot, it's been hard to get them through the FDA process. But I, I remember, you know, specifically uh, that uh, recombinant version of vascular endothelial growth factor never got a legitimate chance and never got a chance to to be employed on patients that it may have helped. And I, I, I'm hoping, and I, I'm seeing, you know, changes in, in some of the protocols, especially with Jason's product. Jason's getting involved in lots of different clinical trials. Sure. Oh, it's great. We can, uh, some of those the variables will get tightened up a little bit as we go forward with these great products. And, and, you know, it's, it's also true with, with how, um, how people are treated. And, and, you know, when patients come in for, you know, second opinions, which we see frequently, um, you, you look at, Say, for instance, the management of osteomyelitis, um, not necessarily going looking at it from a clinical trial standpoint, but there's so many, as you know, so many schools of thought regarding that. And, and you say to yourself, geez, you know, if they're just using antibiotics, are they missing the boat a little bit? You know, shouldn't they be resecting osteomyelitis? So the same thing what you had said, you could use VEGF and in theory, it makes sense. But if you don't offload the foot and it doesn't heal, it's not healing because your product wasn't good. Right not healing because you weren't taking it all, you know, looking at it as a bigger picture issue. Yeah, I'm, I'm with you. You know, it's interesting you mentioned osteomyelitis because it's always been like, you know, I always believed when I was trained uh, that if the bone's dead, it's not coming back. You've got osteomyelitis, you resect the bone, you get a clean margin, you can treat it like a soft tissue infection. But now in, in talking with Warren Joseph, you know, more and more we're seeing antibiotics that can treat osteomyelitis. What's your, what's your philosophy out in Boston regarding osteo? And are you, so, you know, I, I, I it's interesting. I remember one of my colleagues once said that we can do more harm with the antibiotics we prescribe than with the surgery we perform. And so for things like a metatarsal head, for things like a toe, I think resection to a good clean margin with adjunct mop-up therapy as far as antibiotics is concerned is, is the way that I would treat it. Um, I think I, I look at it as like cancer, and I think David Armstrong has done a similar uh, analogy. Mm -hmm. um, you want to resect the tumor. The only way to, to to get the appropriate chemotherapy, in this case, the antibiotic, is to have the actual sample. Nobody starts chemotherapy without knowing what kind of tumor you're treating. And so here, if it's a metatarsal head, rather than just do a biopsy, resect it, and then do adjunct antibiotic therapy. Right. And and what's what's fascinating to me is when you when you tell me what Warren Joseph says, and, and that you could treat it with just antibiotics, and then you take somebody like Paul Kim, who said he doesn't really believe in antibiotics. Right. No, I hear you. Strongly, that all affected bones should be removed. And so, you know, and he might come on your show or, or see this and say, well, that's not exactly what I said. But there's a wide variety of how to treat osteomyelitis. And, and I think to your point earlier about the VEGF and the offloading, um, I was talking to our vascular fellow today. And I told him, I look at metatarsal head resections as being the Swiss army knife of operations. Right. Because what other operation can you get a diagnosis, a cure, offload, and close the wound at the same time? Um, you make an incision on the bottom of the foot, the med head is out, you can, you've can you offloaded, you've gotten rid of the infected bone, and you've also made the diagnosis. So I, I, I tend to lean more towards the surgical approach to osteomyelitis than just relying on antibiotics. I'm with you. And and I, I like that old adage that uh, a patient with diabetes at risk is is a patient with a metatarsal head that is prominent. I mean, it's true. Absolutely. Absolutely. Oh, I agree 100%. All right. So uh, moving on a little bit, can you tell uh, uh, share with uh, 
our audience and listeners, uh, the residency program that you have and the the clerkship program. I mean, I'm, I'm familiar with it, but um, when you go through the process and you're selecting students from all the schools, how's that working for your program? And uh, what what can I share with our students through this podcast that that would be valuable for them in, in thinking about coming coming out to Boston, spending time with you? Well, I mean, I, we've got a program where for the most part, we have two students a month. What What I love is when you have two students from different schools. Because to see them talking and the interaction they have most of the time, I think is priceless. I remember meeting students when I was an extern, and as well as externs when I was a resident who've gone on to do amazing things, and we still keep in contact with each other when we see each other at national meetings. So we have somewhat of an application process where we try to fit the the, the students into the right slots. Um, as I'm sure you're aware, and most programs were aware during the pandemic, um, we cut back obviously, because we couldn't have visitors at the hospital. So we lost a little bit of momentum, as most other programs did. But I I think, you know, doing an externship, doing a one-month rotation with us, uh, you know, I've loved the students, including the students that you've sent us from your school. Um, As far as our residency program is concerned, it's a a three-year program, um, two residents each year. Um, they do a lot of outside rotations their first year. Um, and then the second and third years, they do smaller rotations. They spend time on orthopedics. They spend time on plastic surgery. Um, and, it, and it really has evolved to the point where when they're on those other rotations, when they're more advanced in their time, second and third years, they're also better residents because now they've been through the first year. They've done the intern type stuff, whether it's on general medicine or general surgery or the emergency department. And so I really think it, it it works well and it works to their advantage that they don't go into a high powered pro, uh, rotation where they're handed the knife or expected to be the first assistant and they've never been in an operating room before. Absolutely. So it really works out well the way Dr. Din, Tan Din, who's uh, was recently an ACFAS president, is our program director. Um, she's really worked it out well, where, where it's a great interaction and sort of that builds up almost like a pyramid to get them to the point where when they leave, they're, they're pretty well trained. So I'm proud proud of pretty much every resident that's finished our, I shouldn't say pretty much, every resident has gone on to do some pretty good things. That's great. You know, that's a similar philosophy that Andy Cohen has in Michigan. He said it makes no sense to send someone on a plastics rotation their first year when they don't have the hand skills or the knowledge. And next thing you know, in the second and third year, if they're doing an ortho rotation or plastics, they can literally contribute to the case and get more. A- absolutely. Absolutely. No, that makes a lot of sense. All right. So, um, Let's talk, you know, you and I have traveled around and given some lectures together. And sometimes we meet at meetings with Integra and you'll be talking about products and I'll be talking about CAS. Um, that's been a great experience for me. And I think uh, we've we've really been able to touch a, a lot of doctors and, and gotten them to think about different ways of treating wound care. Um, how does that consulting gig work for you, for other, that and other companies? Because I know a lot of people always ask me, what's it like to consult for a company? Uh, your thoughts on that? Um, you know, it's interesting. Um, I, I think. In addition to teaching students and and, and teaching residents, I, I think that's, as you said, that's that's exciting as well. Um, I think consulting for companies, you know, giving some local lectures, giving some lectures at national meetings, um, it, it's fun, it's interesting, and you get to meet a lot of other people. And you get to meet a lot of other people on on different levels. I mean, I remember giving a lecture at a small for a small hospital wound healing center out in a small town in central Massachusetts. And I, I always do some research on the wound center first. And 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 so I'll show a picture of their hospital and their staff. And, and I'll tell them, look, you know, I'm just like you. You know, I don't have all the answers. I have patients that that also don't heal. Um, I'm just here to talk to you about my experience with this particular product. Right. And 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 I think being more at one with with your audience, whether it's on a national stage or whether it's a small dinner intimate program. Um, I think it's really important. Um, I think if you get up there and you feel like you're on a high horse and you're, you know, you're bashing other companies and you're the only one in the room who thinks you know what you're doing, um, I, I think that's a huge turnoff. I know I've been turned off by by speakers that do that. Um, I think the consulting is 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 good. Um, I think if there's a product that's going to help my patient, then then I'm all for it. Um, you know, there there have been and and kudos to you. Um, uh, for years, uh, the the deaconess, we didn't do total contact casting. And um, I remember, well, now it's been a multi- number of years. I remember using your product, um, the the easy cast and uh, using that on on patients. And it was just a total game changer. 
Um, I think that, uh, you know, seeing patients who, who actually will come in and say, I think I know it need to go back into a cast. That to me is just music to my ears. I know, and that so is I, I, it's great. And, uh, you know, we've taught numerous people how to use it. We've incorporated it in some of our smaller trials. Um, and, and I think it's really important that if I'm going to be a consultant for a company or talk on their product, I have to be impressed by it first. I, I'm not going to use it. I remember once we had a rep that came into our office selling antibiotics. And I said, well, why should I use your antibiotics? He told me, well, the guy down the street is using it. That, that to me is not a selling point. Right. Right. You know, right. and one other thing on on product, I, I have another adage, and I'll tell reps this right to their face, that a good product will sell itself, but a bad rep will ruin a good product. Well, there's a lot of truth to that. We, we could talk about that for, for an hour, probably. <laughs> I'm sure we could. <laughs> well, that's, well, that's interesting, because if you're a rep, let's talk about it for a minute. If you're a rep and you're representing any company with any product, um, you're job is to to be the right hand of the clinicians to help them treat their patients or help them set the stage for healing for their patients. And I, I think the best reps, and we all have had them. And when I was in practice, you know, every Monday, every other Monday, I'd see the organogenesis rep, you know, and I'd, I'd yep. in mind, I'd have patients that I'd thinking, okay, these are patients that I think would really, really benefit from their products. I think those relationships are crucial. And, and like anything, like the soft skills we were just talking about for our residents, a lot of the best reps have those soft skills. I am I am not a fan. I don't mind if a rep comes in and we see some patients together, but if a rep is going to ask one of my nurses to look at the list of patients mm. and, and try and identify who they might be able to have me use their product on, they they get away scot free. Yep. And you know, they have no skin in the game and mm. and and Forget about cost, forget about payment, reimbursement, because that doesn't really affect me with the type of practice I'm in. But I've got to do well by my patient. And 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 I don't want to, I don't want to pass something on to them that's either going to be harmful or just not work and be a waste of our time and a waste of someone's money. I, I totally agree. Well, it makes sense. If you're going to be a consultant for a company, it's best to have had that product uh, in your hands with your patients and and see that it works to to help the patient. Otherwise, it, it just the whole the equation doesn't work, right? Right. Totally agree. All right. Hey, can I give a, a quick little shout out to Beth Israel Deaconess Medical Center? Certainly. Absolutely. So interesting story, Barry. In 2018, my son, 19, was married, got married, went to Croatia on their honeymoon, and through E. coli or another bacteria ended up with HUS or hemolytic uremic syndrome. And they were living in Boston at the time. And I remember you and I were talking a lot about this back then. So he flew back to Boston, got admitted to Beth Israel Deaconess Medical Center, put in ICU, his kidneys were going down. I mean, potentially life-threatening. And the doctors there were phenomenal. And they brought in a monoclonal antibody, Solaris, literally saved his kidneys. Um, every time I go to Boston and we drive by uh, Beth Israel, I, I just have this great feeling. So uh, that's part of, you know, not only are our students loving the fact that they can come spend time with you, but being in that academic health environment to me is is priceless, especially as a, in a clerkship, um, really getting into an environment that is just, multidisciplinary and and just one of the best institutions in the world. So I thought I'd throw that plug in there for for your institution. Yeah, I you know I appreciate that. I've um uh you know on a personal note, uh my my wife is a two-time cancer survivor. Oh. And her treatment has also been at at Beth Israel Deaconess and 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 she's still around and uh you know, whenever I we have a patient on their floor, I still run into the nurses who took care of her, and they always ask how is she doing. And um, you know, it's it, it's great to say that she's doing great. And so it, it really is when you're younger and you're a resident, or and you know, we we didn't have our kids at the Beth Israel, and so um, that was before the merger. So the hospitals weren't they were separate: Deaconess Hospital and Beth Israel. So um, our children were born in a different hospital. But 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 since the merger, you know, it's it's a much bigger institution. And and to be able to say, look, I, I've had my treatment there. My wife has been treated there. Um, when you're young, you feel like you're, you know, you're indestructible. You know, you don't need a hospital. You're not going to break a bone. You're not going to get sick. Um, but, to, you know, as we age and you have to use the services that are at the institution you're at and it turns out, well, makes you not want to leave. 
No, plus you, you, you know, it feels so good to have faith and trust in your doctors and the environment. I think it makes a big difference in the outcome of any procedure. Absolutely. No, I totally agree with you. Um, so, uh, Barry, one of the things you and I have talked about and um, something that we're going to introduce on this podcast, uh, I, I always, I've always been interested in what makes people tick and their personalities. And there's so many common themes about people that have been coming on the podcast. One of them was that path of mentorship, not only mentors for them, but they're also mentors for younger, younger upcoming physicians. Uh, so I was doing some a little bit of research on personality profiles, as I was sharing with you. And uh, we have the big five personality profile out there. And so I took it and it was uh, funny because my wife took it also. And they did kind of a, a showing you where your personality fits in. And, you know, for example, for me, um, I'm high in conscientiousness, um, high in extroversion, extroversion and high in openness. Um, and then my wife complimented me kind of, she had higher areas in certain areas and lower, but I was thinking after hearing all the different folks that I've been bringing on the podcast, uh, when we talked earlier in the week and you were willing to take the test, I was wondering if maybe, uh, we could share some of these outcomes and talk about perhaps how they've impl- uh, that personality has impacted your career. Does that sound sure. like fair? It's totally fair. I took the test and uh, um, I just opened up the results. So if I look like I'm looking down at my phone, I, I am. Um, I, I was really high in agreeableness okay. and and also extroversion. I mean, go figure. I agreed to be on your podcast and you and I are having this conversation as if we're sitting across having a cup of coffee or a beer. Right. Um, so, so I think that's predictable. Um, I was moderately high on conscientiousness um, and openness, uh, which I think is is consistent. Um, the mistake I made, and I shared this with you earlier, is um, I was telling my wife about this test, and uh, certain things she she thinks I get irritable a little bit sooner than I might think I get irritable, um, which is fine. After almost forty years of marriage, she has that that luxury. Um, but I told her that I scored really low on the neuroeroticism part. <laughs> and uh, her, her response to me pretty much was, what kind of test did you take? Oh and God, then I read what, the word again and realized- What kind of podcast is this? I, exactly. And then I read the, the the word again and realized it's neuroticism. So I scored very low on that, which which in my opinion was good. I didn't want to be taking a neuroerotic test. Um, and I don't know whether scoring low or high would have been good or, for your ratings perhaps, but um, I I didn't, uh, I, I'm glad I scored low on what the what the test actually was. Very good. Uh, so, a couple thoughts on that. You know, the agreeableness portion of the test looks at two things: compassion and politeness. So that makes sense. Yeah, I think um, I think it does. Um, I think uh, I, you know, as I scroll through, I'm looking at all the the subsets and compassion. I was I was very high. Um, politeness moderately high. Um, and and I think you know, from the politeness standpoint, I think moderately high and high is still you know both somewhat interchangeable. Um, the the test was fascinating, um, and and I thank you for uh, for having me take it because uh, I, I thought it was it was great to read all the sub settings and um, and to learn a little bit about myself and my own view of myself. Right. Um, so something about that extroversion. The two components of extroversion are enthusiasm and and assertiveness. So that doesn't shock me either, Barry. I mean, we've worked together for years. That is just totally in line with your personality. Yeah, my wife disagreed on the orderliness. Um, I came up moderately high, and and she thinks I'm definitely not as orderly as I might think I am. <laughs> so, so for the for the listeners, um, orderliness and industriousness comes under the conscientiousness big bullet. And um, I was high in industriousness. Um, I w- I was a little bit lower in orderliness, but I did you hear know that. Oh, go ahead. I'm sorry. I hear I heard a funny story that if you're high in extroversion, which you said you are. Yep. The the link between people that get piercings and tattoos are always highest in extroversion. Really? Yeah, I think. I mean, so maybe you know, if you if you hadn't grown up in the seventies and eighties, you'd be all tatted up with earrings or something. Wow. You know, it's funny when I look at orderliness. Um, when when I was a resident, we used to do a lot of our surgeries in a smaller operating room, and and we didn't get a scrub tech, okay. and so our the student who may never have been in an operating room before was the scrub tech. Uh-huh. And so as a resident, you were, you know, learning from the attending, doing the surgery and also teaching the student how to take care of their back table. And, and so um, when I was a, a resident, I met this um, 
a woman who was a nurse at the, in the OR, and um, I got to know her. And I said, you know, you, you would actually be really friendly with my wife. And so I introduced the two of them, and 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 she and her husband and my wife and I became very close friends. But I'll never forget the time that she told my wife that I was a slob and that my back table was a mess. Uh-oh. And I and I used to think, you know, what happens in the OR should stay in the OR. But clearly, my reputation in that situation was not one of being orderly. So <laughs> I throw that out as uh, maybe I scored a little higher than I thought I should have. Oh, that's funny. Now, you also went, mentioned openness, which is a combination of aesthetics and intellect. You said you were high there, too. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Very good. Yeah. The, I, I, uh, so how do you think these, you know, so we have the downside of you having a messy back table, but what are the upsides of the things you were hiring? Do you think besides agreeableness, we talked about that. Well, you know, I think the industriousness was, was high. Um, I think that, um, you know, as you mentioned, it's part of uh, conscientiousness. Um, I, I think uh, um, I, I like to think, and again, this is, it's very subjective because it's looking at you, you looking at you as opposed to someone else looking at you. So sometimes we look in a mirror that's a little bit different than mm-hmm. how others see us. Um, so I think the things, and again, I'm just kind of scrolling through it. Um, I think the things that I was high in, um, oh, geez, I'm trying to find uh, compassion, again, very high, um, agreeableness, probably I rated myself a little bit higher than I maybe should have. Um, but but overall, you know, it, it I liked what I read. And 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 it kind of when it put the questions to topics and 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 graded them and scored them, it 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 kind of made sense. Interesting. I it makes sense. It made sense for me too. One other thing that was interesting, the industriousness portion, which is part of conscientiousness. Um, from my understanding, there's no correlation that would be indicative of somebody being industrious. For example, your intelligence level has nothing to do with your industriousness. Um, so I think it's it's hard to find the, that inner core that leads somebody to be industrious. Oh, okay, sure. Interesting. I, I, it's all fascinating. So I, I'm, I'm very similar to you. And uh, I just, uh, the, ex, the extroversion thing kind of caught me by surprise. I am very enthusiastic about things I like to do. And I, I can be fairly assertive, which I was high, but I don't really think of myself as that assertive either. But um, maybe it was how I answered the questions that day. <laughs> so, so Barry, a couple, couple last, couple other questions I have for you. Um, where do you think the the profession's heading in the future? And that, let's say, let's talk about that one first. So, you know, as, as I mentioned earlier, you know, the students that we're getting, um, the, the the trainees that we're seeing, um, you know, the future, in my opinion, is, is bright. Um, I, I think uh, going from one and two year residencies, you know, the old PSRs and PR, PMRs and, uh, you know, RPRs, the rotating residency um, to now where you've got, you know, three year and in a few cases, four year programs, the, the training is just spectacular. Um, fellowships, if, if, if someone so desires to do a fellowship, I think, uh, it, it's just icing on the cake, but certainly our residents who've either gone on to do fellowships or gone into practice have, have pretty much, you know, uniformly been successful. So I think the future is bright. The, the downside, and, and, and these are some of the staggering statistics that we've heard at, you know, meetings recently is that the enrollment is down. So, you know, you, you could put out a, you know, a great product, but if you're limited with the number of people you've got, you know, that's going to, the profession could suffer as far as that goes. So I, I think it's something we've got to work on. And, you know, you're the type of person who's certainly at the forefront of that. Well, I can share some stats with you, which I think are interesting. And I think they mirror what you said about COVID. Um, year after year after year for the last three years, we've gone down between 12 and 15%. So we're 40% down in applications compared to where we were three years ago, which is a lot, right? Yeah. And, and my, my thought on that is that we're, we've struggled mightily. We're a small profession. We're not at the forefront. Even students that come in and, and interview for our college today did not know six months ago that podiatric medicine was, an, was not an offshoot of allopathic medicine. Mm -hmm. they don't even realize we're on in our own sphere if you will with 11 colleges and a different application process so the common themes that i've seen over the years for applicants are they either had or they or their family members were treated by a podiatrist or they had just a phenomenal shadowing experience or perhaps there's a family member 
But if you think about it, Barry, since 2019, right away, you start talking about COVID, you start shutting down offices, shutting down hospitals. These students did not have an opportunity to shadow the docs and interface with the doctors who are really pleased with their choice of profession and really liked it because they tailored their practice to be what they like it to be. So I think um, we're going to see, it. Uh, we've got some tailwinds, right? And the fact that we can't, everything's opening up again. Students are going to be able to get out and shadow. And I, I can speak for the AA, the American Association of Colleges of Podiatric Medicine, that a student recruitment proposal has been approved uh, that will blanket the country at 220 undergraduate universities in the next fiscal year, really opening up and highlighting podiatric medicine and what it has to offer. So that's a good thing. You know, you know, if you've got uh, time for one quick anecdote, um, you had asked me earlier, you know, how I got into podiatry, yeah. um, told the whole story about the fraternity brother and interviewing, but I didn't know any podiatrists. Um, and so I literally looked in the phone book and found a podiatry group on the north side of Rochester. And I went and spent an afternoon. I didn't even shadow. I just went and talked to him in his office. Wow. And uh, it turns out that the head of that practice um, came up to me at a national meeting and we started talking and he's actually retiring this year. He's in his eighties Oh my God. and he's retiring this year. And I've been friendly with his daughter, who's a podiatrist who practices in Pittsburgh is married to a plastic surgeon has done all sorts of clinical trials on various things. But I make it a point to see the person who essentially was responsible or whose practice was responsible for me getting into this whole thing. And, and it's amazing how it comes full circle. So I think from a from a standpoint of trying to impress upon undergrads that this is a viable profession to go down that road, um, we should almost set up a network. And I'm sure there is, there's mentoring networks out there, but a network of offices that either you were an alumni or there's a college nearby um, that somebody can spend time in your clinic. We've seen them in our clinic, but we're not the rank and file. We're not a private practice, which is what many students when they graduate go on to do. So I think that kind of thing, shadowing, mentoring, um, is 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 so important to getting more people through the door. Well, it's funny you mentioned that because part of that entire plan is to connect the advisors and the students with a shadowing mentor doctor right in the community where the undergraduate university is. And I've I've actually been uh, interfacing with ACFAS because it's in their charge this year to open up practices to provide mentoring. So we may merge these programs together. It's um, low hanging fruit. It is low hanging fruit. And it's not that difficult. I don't think. Um, one thing I did, we did not talk about Barry was your service to the profession, like with the American college of foot and ankle surgeons, you've had a lot of, you've done a lot of work in different capacities and you just came off the board last year, right? Yes. Yeah. That's, um, so it's interesting. I was at a meeting. Um, oh, it was in Chicago, probably in the early early two thousands. And uh, John Steenstra uh, at the time was uh, was on the board. And um, I'm not sure if he was president elect or he was on the executive track. And and I remember he invited me out to dinner. And I had never I didn't know who he was. And um, so we went out to dinner and uh, we had sushi, as a matter of fact. And he made some really complimentary remarks to me. And I was looking at him and geez, you know, I'm, I feel like I'm, I'm honored. Um, and so he invited me to get more involved. Um, he sent a group of us out to Keystone, Colorado, when evidence-based medicine was first getting, you know, in vogue. And um, I met a whole bunch of other leaders and volunteers in the organization in the American College of Foot and Ankle Surgeons, um, got to know and become really good friends with people like Sean Grambart, Troy Buffelli, uh, Tom Rukas, Scott Millay, Jay Phillips, uh, you know, the list just goes on and on and on. And we spent a week learning about evidence-based medicine, but also spending a lot of time interacting with each other. Fast forward to when I became on the um, the annual scientific conference committee, uh, which then propelled me to um, become chair of that committee. Um, I've been involved with the research committee. I've been on different subgroups of that. And then I actually, one of the great honors that I had in the profession was winning the Distinguished Service Award. Yes. And um, I won that. And everybody thought they called that the Lifetime Achievement Award, which means, you know, you've reached the pinnacle and now you're on the back nine. Uh -oh. And the next thing I know, I get invited to be on the board. And, and so I think at the time I was the only person who'd won the Distinguished Service Award, thinking I'd given all I could to the profession. 
And then I get asked to be on the board. So being on the board to me was such a terrific experience. Um, it happened during COVID and, and, and show, um, uh, you know, a little shout out to Scott Nelson, who was president during that, that time. And he did a remarkable job having us move forward as a board, despite having virtual meetings like this. Right. Um, part of the thing about being on the board is being able to have the camaraderie and the interpersonal relationships. And, um, you know, we missed that for a year or so, but our annual meeting, we had one in 2020 in, in, in San Antonio, and we pushed the one back in 2021 in Vegas, but we never missed a year of in-person. Right. And so, you know, kudos to the board, to, kudos to my associate, Tan Din, for, you know, following up, following Scott. Um, it, it's an amazing organization. Um, you know, shout out, too, to one of my other uh, colleagues, JT Marcoux, uh, who's, you know, leadership of the American Board of Foot and Ankle Surgeons, which I've been involved with as well. Um the, the people who are behind the curtain, I'm telling you, those volunteers, they don't necessarily get up on the podium. They don't necessarily get up and give you a lecture, but but they're the ones who keep keep things moving forward. And and I, I'm just in awe of being in their experience and being in there involved with what they do and seeing what they do. And just we have such a great profession. I, I you know, I could go on and on and on dropping names, dropping organizations. Um, it, it's just been a great ride. It really has. And and you know what? That's the common theme with anybody that's worked with ACFAS. It's just a phenomenal, top-notch organization. Um, and thank you, Barry, for all your contributions to n not just the training of students, but in the background, in those service arenas. Thank you so much. I know the profession. Oh, no, thank you. Um, any last words before we uh, we close? Any, what would you say to a prospective student that, that want to go into podiatric medicine? You know, I would say check it out. Have an open mind. Um, I think there's, uh, you know, there's a lot of benefit. Um, I, I certainly have enjoyed the ride I've had. It's not necessarily the the ride that anyone else or everyone else is going to have. Um, but I think it's it's a great profession. I think, you know, hearing students and hearing residents say that it gives you that ability to combine medicine and and surgery, and and you could you could opt to do more surgery, you could be somebody who never steps foot in an operating room and you can, you can do very well. I mean, there are so many different subsets of the field that, that we do that, that no one else really does. Um, you know, orthopedic foot and ankle surgeons are, are good. Um, they certainly have their, their place and they have their role. Um, but I don't think they necessarily get the same patient um, interaction that we see, you know, what, what could be more rewarding than somebody coming in with an infected ingrown toenail and, and, and you, you make them feel better. Um, or somebody has an ulcer and you heal them and they don't have to be hospitalized or lose part of their foot. So there are so many little things that we can do that I think are, are, are just to me, just such, so impactful on, on the patients and the community that we treat. So as I said, have an open mind and, and, you know, check us out. I, well said, and, and I, I concur 100%. Thank you. So, uh, Barry, thank you for your time and energy and expertise. It's such a pleasure to have you on the Dean's Chat. I look forward to having you back down the road. Hey, I appreciate the invitation, Jeff. And, you know, the weather's getting a little warmer here, but I'm sure it's it's great 12 months of the year in Arizona. Yeah, a little warm in the summer, but you're always welcome to come down anytime. Hey, I may take you up on that invitation. <laughs> Sounds good. And to all of our listeners, thank you for so much for joining us today on Dean's Chat. We will continue to bring the leaders in the profession and the voices in the profession. And again, Barry, we really appreciate you joining us today. And we're going to be sending you one of these really cool Dean's Chat cups that you can drink out of <laughs> every morning. So thanks, everybody. And we'll see you next week. Uh, don't forget to be a subscriber on YouTube. Uh, give us a five-star rating on Apple Podcasts. And cheers. Bye, everyone. Bye.